Good morning, everyone. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ. We're glad that you're here. Pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you and that you have been keeping yourself safe during this rather strange time. Uh, and pray that God watched over you and helps you. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 24 and verse 10. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Sunday Acts study. And my name is Mike Mendez, and you can reach me at the email address that you see on your screen and pray that uh, you get something out of this. And if you have any questions or even if you want to disagree with me, by all means, send me a little text or a little email and I'd, I'd love to consider other thoughts because I'm certainly not inspired. And I'm just simply trying to do the same thing you are and that is try to get to heaven and take as many people with me as possible. So we're glad you're here. Uh, let's have a small little prayer if you would. Father in heaven, we're just thankful for the day and we're thankful for the time that you give us and Thankful for this means whereby we can uh, study and think about your word without necessarily having to be in the same room with somebody. Uh, but we know that it's really secondary to what you want us to do, and that is to actually be involved in speaking and uh, discussing your word. And so we pray that you would help us as we do that. Pray also that you help all who are listening to understand that I'm not inspired uh, in any way. And so it's a matter of them listening to what I've learned for the many years that I've been studying. Uh, but it's up to them to make sure that what I'm teaching is actually found in the Word of God. And that's something that I've added or uh, some emphasis that I'm making that's not made in the, in the scriptures. Because what we want to do is please you. So we pray that you watch over us and help us as we study in your son's name. Amen. And remember that we're on what I call Paul and what some people call Paul's fourth missionary journey. Remember that he had been arrested in Jerusalem just a few days earlier, and uh, a plot arose in order to, to kill him. And so um, uh, Lysias, the commander, sent him to Caesarea. And so now he's at Caesarea, and that's where we're at now. In Caesarea, uh, Felix, the governor of, of that area, had called for the people in Jerusalem to come down to accuse Paul. And so they had brought a lawyer, and they made charges against Paul. And we looked at those last week. And so if you haven't heard those, you might want to look at those because it really gives you a sense of the justice between uh, the Jewish people, their sense of justice, and the justice of the Roman Empire, which at the time was actually um, three or four levels above that of the Jewish community. The Jewish community had become arrogant and had become uh, individuals who thought that just because they had a relationship with God that they could pretty much do whatever they wanted to and God would bless them and take care of them because of who they were and yet uh, they were mistaken about that so that's what's going on in Caesarea the council has already given their accusations and Paul now is going to answer us beginning in verse 10 of Acts 24 those of you watching will notice that again I have my e-sword up so that you can take a look at it and it's uh, beneficial and helpful and I would encourage you to download it and get it if you don't have it and uh, it's free I mean there are there are modules that you have to pay for but a lot of it is free and so I encourage you to, uh, to do that so uh, here we are and the the accusations have been made the, the high priest has has told them what you know what the accusations were or his or his lawyer did and so verse 10 says when the governor had nodded for him to speak Paul responded knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation. I cheerfully make my defense, since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to work, worship, neither in the temple, nor in the synagogue, nor in the city itself, did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot, nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me. But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the, the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you and to make accusations if they should have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves 
tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council. Other than, uh, other than for this one statement, which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial uh, before you today. So that's Paul's little defense there. Now, uh, notice that as Paul begins his defense, he, he points out that he um, is pleased to be able to make his defense uh, before uh, uh, Governor Festus, because, uh, or, or Felix, sorry, uh, before Governor Felix, because he understands that uh, Felix has uh, been able to keep the, the peace. Uh, in verse 24, chapter 24, 10 says, when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul responded, knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Since you can take note uh, of the fact that, that no more than 12 years, uh, 12 days ago, uh, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. So, so Paul points out that, that he's cheerful to make his defense before Felix. And probably one of the reasons for that was because Felix was married to Drusilla and Drusilla was, was a Jew. And so uh, therefore he was kind of um, uh, interested in what Paul was teaching and in whatever way it might uh, affect the, the Jewish community since he was kind of in relation with that Jewish community, not just as the governor, but on an individual basis. Uh, and so he's cheerfully making his defense. Uh, and, and notice that it says he's, he's making his defense. You see, the way Christians make our defense is not by bombs, it's not by bullets, it's not by knives. The way we make our defense is by speaking to people with the sword of the spirit. In Ephesians chapter six, he says that's the only offensive weapon that we have is the sword of the spirit, which is, of course, the word of God. And the reason that we, we, the way we make our defense is by telling people about the facts of the scripture and the facts about Jesus being Lord. That's what's under consideration in 1 Peter chapter 3, where it says down here at about verse um, 15, but let's start here with verse 13. It says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed and do not fear their intimidations and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience so that in, in the things in which they slander you, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Now, as as Peter is writing, he's writing in the midst of this section that deals with persecution and intimidation. And even though there's persecution and intimidation, he says that we're still to sanctify, that means set Christ apart as Lord in our heart. Even though this, this intimidation comes, this fear comes, and, and this trouble comes, we're supposed to still have the Lord ruling in our heart as Lord, and that we're to be ready to make a defense. Uh, this word de defense is, is the Greek word but we get our word apologetics. And uh, apologetics means that you give the, the reason for why it is that you believe something. And so that's our defense. Uh, and so God expects us to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. So it's not just good enough to say, well, I believe what God says. They need to know why you believe. Uh, they shouldn't believe just simply because you say you believe or because you like it or because you think it's okay. They need to be convinced because it's the truth. And so sometimes they need help in understanding what that is so that they can know and be able to, on the basis of the evidence, uh, uh, understand what you're doing because that's what faith is. Faith isn't just something that says, well, I believe something and therefore that settles it uh, no matter what it might be or how bizarre it might be. That's what some people want us to believe. Some people want us to believe that just because I believe something that that makes it true. And especially in our country nowadays, where, where individuals don't want other individuals to have a freedom of speech or freedom to speak unless they agree with them. If they don't agree with them, then the person that, that is affronted by that, uh, they say, well, well, we believe that, you're, that you are offending us uh, instead of them looking at the truth. So remember that we're supposed to give a defense, especially in the midst of intimidation and trouble and persecution. That's what we're supposed to do. But notice how we're supposed to do it. Uh, uh, we're supposed to do it with gentleness and reverence. We're, we're not to be mean or rude. We're to be gentle and we're to, and we're to be respectful when we do it reverent. 
because we're all supposed to keep a good conscience so that in the things in which they slander you, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be, will be put to shame. And so uh, uh, Paul gives his defense. That's what Paul is doing. And so he's, gi he's giving his defense and he's glad to do it in front of Felix. Now verse 11 says, since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Now, so what that means is that on our little, on our little um, journey here, from here to here, by the time Paul got to Caesarea, it was 12 days from the time that he had arrived in Jerusalem. It wasn't even two weeks. And that's what Paul's pointing out. It, it wasn't even two weeks that uh, this is happening. And, and so uh, therefore, he's basically saying, I really haven't had enough time to cause a, a ruckus or to uh, cause problems. And, and he says uh, also, um, uh, since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. So he, he says, and he's going to Jerusalem to worship. So if he's going to worship, why in the world would he be coming in order to create a problem or difficulties? And then it's, he says in verse 12, and neither in the temple nor in the synagogue, nor in the city itself, did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot. So he also points out that, that if he, if, if Felix will examine them, they will find out that he um, uh, didn't engage in any kind of discussions or uh, you and I might say uh, uh, discussions about revolt or a coup or any of those kind of things to overthrow the government or to, or to overthrow the uh, religious system that's there. And that's not the way, that's not the way the gospel works. We're not, we're not individuals who cause riots in order to make changes. Remember, the defense that we make is by the word of God, and the way we cause change is by changing each individual. If you change a leader's heart, then you will change the course of the, the, course of the whole nation. And so that's the way we do it. We, we don't create riots. Every once in a while, you'll hear about some uh, supposed Christian who gets so animated or... Um, or um, defensive about uh, abortion clinics that they'll bomb them or they'll they'll you know kill an abortion doctor uh, because of what's going on and uh, the problem is is that's not the way god wants us to do things we, we're not the ones that are supposed to take vengeance we, we leave vengeance to the lord what we're supposed to do is tr try to save people before his vengeance comes and then he and so he wasn't causing the right he wasn't causing discussion i mean he only had 12 days and a few of those he had already spent in prison and so it's, he even had less time than 12 days in order to, in which to create these problems. Now verse 13 says, nor can they prove to you the charges of which they are now accusing me. See, the problem was that, that the lawyer wasn't there when these things were done. The high priest and those, and those that were accusing him weren't there. They, were, they weren't around. They're, they're doing this by hearsay. Now in a legal court of law, hearsay is not admissible. In other words, I can't tell you that I heard somebody say that he was going, that, that he heard that somebody killed somebody. That would never uh, be issued as a, as a witness for the fact that that person murdered somebody else. Now, I might be able to tell you that, that the person who told me, I'm a witness to what he told me, but as far as seeing the actual event, no. And that's why Paul says they can't prove it. They can't prove these charges. They can say them all they want. But they're not the ones that were there. They're not the ones that, that saw him. They're not the ones that were there when he was being beaten, why he was arrested. N none of them are. Uh, and so, and even, even uh, Lysias, the commander, he wasn't quite sure what was going on. If you remember, he wanted to flog Paul in order to find out what was happening. And so he, he didn't even know it. So there's no way they can prove those charges because the people that accused him aren't even there. Verse 14, he says, <clears throat> but this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. And so Paul, Paul does say that if they are angry at him because he is a follower of the way, then he understands that. And that, that's, what he's, that's what he's pointing out here. He says, but, but this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve God our fathers. Now, I want you to notice, I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, I want you to notice that he doesn't call it the Church of Christ. He calls it the way. 
Um, sometimes people have the idea that you have to have a certain name on your church building. And, and I think that's created a lot of problems. And I think that's added to the uh, denominational differences that we have in, uh, in the United States today. Uh, every group uh, wants to put their own name on their church building so that you will so that it will identify them and you will know who they are instead of just maybe putting the term Christians or putting the word the way or the church or something like that uh, we have to we have to identify ourselves so only those people who agree with us will then associate with us and so sometimes that creates difficulty now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the name Church of Christ but I'm not I don't believe either there's anything wrong with the name the Church of God or, or the the Church of the Firstborn or the way and that's what I, what I want us to understand. If we just stuck to what the Bible says, I think there would be a whole lot less, less uh, division uh, in the church and division among God's people. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody was gonna, is going to believe the same thing. Matter of fact, you can have the name Church of Christ, and you'll have a lot of people in there that don't believe the same thing on some subjects. But that doesn't mean they're not, they're not Christians and they're not trying to get to heaven, because that's what we're all trying to do. Anyway, I just wanted to point out that... Uh, he said, according to the way. And the reason it's called the way is because it's referred to as the way of Jehovah. It's that, it's that reference that was made by, um, by um, God when he was talking with Abraham. And he told Ab Abraham that I know you're going to teach your children the way. And so that's where that expression came from. So there's nothing wrong with being called the way. There's nothing wrong with any other name that identifies us as God's people. That's the first thing I want you to notice. The second thing I want you to notice is they call it a sect. It's a sect. And, and, and that word sect uh, there, and let me, just, let me just show you so we can see it. That word sect there uh, is, uh, a, according to, to Strong's, is defined as a choice or a party or a, a heresy. Uh, notice that the Greek word up there. And I'll hit this so you can see it over here. And it's uh, the idea of, of this word. Uh, and if you notice, as you look at it there, uh, uh, heresies, and, and that is to act or to take, to capture, storming a city, ch choosing or choice, that one is chosen, a body of men following their own tenets, okay, of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, of Christians. So they're called a sect because they're following the idea of being a Christian, just like the Pharisees are a sect because they're following the, the, the teachings of the, of the Pharisees. And so that, that's what a sect is. A sect is somebody who, who follows a certain, a certain idea or a certain way of thinking. And certainly Christians follow a certain way of thinking. And they're called a sect because they're a part of, or they're a, a, a division of, you might say, of the Jewish community. They saw them differently, like they saw the Sadducees differently and the Pharisees differently, and so that they were considered a, a sect. And what I'd like to suggest to you is that uh, uh, God's people are uh, supposed to be people who aren't a sect. And so we're, we're not identified by some, some certain a name on our building or some um, certain group of individuals but we should be identified as individuals who are trying to serve God and follow him. And in that sense, uh, we're a sect. And so Paul says that they call it a sect. He doesn't call it a sect, but I just want to just identify that so we can understand it. And he says, uh, he says um, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers. And, and so he says, when he says the God of our fathers, he's not, he's not saying that he's following a different God. He's not saying that when he became a Christian, he gave up everything in the Old Testament and no longer believes those things in the Old Testament. Now, he might not be following the, the uh, strict mandates of the, old, of the Old Testament, but he is following and continuing with the process that was started in that Old Testament. Remember, the, the uh, Bible doesn't start in Matthew. The Bible starts in Genesis. Genesis tells us about God bringing about this group of people. And so Abraham points out that he is serving the God of our fathers. So he's not serving a different God. What this also tells you then is that if Paul is identifying Jesus as God, then God and Jesus, or I'm sorry, then Jesus is part of the God who was worshiped in the Old Testament. And, and therefore he, he is identified with God. 
And so he's saying that he served the God of our fathers. Notice what he says, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. Now, notice that he doesn't say, I'm following everything in the law and the prophets, because there were some things now that Paul didn't have to do that they did in the Old Testament. Uh, they had to eat certain meats. Paul would sometimes eat certain meats when he was with Jews. And then when he's with Gentiles, he wouldn't necessarily st stick to those regulations. Um, he, he, didn't, he didn't have to keep the Sabbath as the, as the Jewish commandment was, uh, except for the fact that he was a Jew. And so he would keep it from, uh, from that, a national standpoint, but he, he didn't expect um, Gentiles to keep it. Uh, but he did believe everything that is in accordance with the law and the prophets that is written in the prophets. Now, this is really a kind of, I um, remember, that, remember that the Holy Spirit is using Paul's mouth because the, the Bible taught that when they are standing before governors and rulers that the Holy Spirit would be speaking through them. So the, the Holy Spirit is, is basically pointing out that if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're not believing the law and the prophets. You're not believing what is written. Because Paul says, I do, and I believe everything in accordance with the law, and that is written in the prophets. So if you, if you don't believe the prophets, uh, and if you, if you don't believe, I'm sorry, if you don't believe Jesus, then, then you're not going to believe the law, and you're not going to believe the prophets, because that's who the prophets spoke about, and that's what the law was about. The prophets spoke about the coming of Jesus, and, and the, the law uh, was for the purpose of the coming of Jesus, and, and was spoken to them in First uh, Peter chapter 1, uh, and down here at verse, uh, what is it? Yeah, right here. Down here at verse, um, oh, we can start at verse 6. He's speaking about, um, speaking to Christians who are suffering. Verse 6 says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, depending the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Now look at verse 10. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiries seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So notice that he says that this salvation that these individuals were, were proving that they were worthy of by enduring this persecution, this salvation was what the prophets prophesied about, and they made careful search about it, about it, trying to find out who was under consideration, seeking to know what person or times the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ. So the prophets predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow, and it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, when he says you, he means the people who, Paul, who Peter is writing to. The, the, the message is being fulfilled to them. That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul is pointing out over here, uh, or the Holy Spirit is pointing out, when he says that Paul believes everything in his accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. If you don't believe in Jesus, then you don't believe the law and the prophets. It's really just that simple. Because the, from the very beginning, uh, even in Genesis chapter, chapter um, 3, we have, we have the very first indication that God was going to send a Messiah and a Savior. He was going to save the world but through that Messiah and through that Savior, repeated in, in Genesis chapter 12, where God makes the promise to Abraham that through his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed in verse 3, uh, and so on and so on down the line. Uh, it's, it's always about the coming of this person who is going to save us. So if you don't believe in Jesus, then you don't really believe the law and the prophets. And now verse 15 says, having a hope in God. Now, now, notice that Paul's hope is in God. Remember what hope means. Hope in the Bible isn't just I want something. Hope in the Bible means that I, that I want something, and I know I'm going to get it, and it's something that I, I don't have at the present time, but I know I'm going to get it, so it's in the future. And so Paul is saying, I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to be saved, and this hope is in God. 
And so again, notice that he doesn't use the specific reference of Jesus, but he uses the reference of God because he's tying in his hope with the God that he talked about over here, who, who the prophets prophesied about and preached. And then he says, which, which these men, the Jewish community that are accusing him, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And so Paul, Paul is saying that even these Jewish men, that they have this hope, and that hope is that there's going to be a resurrection. Now, it's interesting that in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the church at Corinth was taught that the resurrection was either over or there was no resurrection or something. And it's kind of strange when you think about it. And Paul uh, was correcting them and wrote them uh, 1 Corinthians to answer a number of questions they had. And verse chapter 15, it deals entirely with the uh, resurrection and the proof of the resurrection, the fact that there is a resurrection and how the resurrection is going to be. And so it points out that there's going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Now, the Sadducees don't believe that. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, the spirit, or angels. But the Pharisees do, and most of the Jewish people who were religious believed in a resurrection that was coming. Uh, and the Old Testament does speak a little bit about it, but it doesn't make a big emphasis on it. But that emphasis is now um, uh, obvious with the coming of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. But I want you to also notice that there are some people who believe that there's going to be uh, two or three different resurrections. There's going to be so the, the resurrection of some people at the uh, beginning of the thousand year reign. And then supposedly there's going to be another resurrection at the end of the thousand year reign. And there's going to be, a, and depending on what view you hold, that there's going to be a resurrection of some people uh, maybe during the, the uh, uh, seven years of tribulation, according to them. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says there is a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And that fits with what Jesus told them in John chapter 5. If you go to John chapter 5 for a minute, where Jesus is pointing out that he can give people life, he says here, beginning in verse 24, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, remember, he's addressing his audience. He's not talking to us. Although it might apply to us, he's talking to a specific audience who was alive at the time he's preaching. Now notice what he says to them. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed, has passed out of death into life. And so uh, what he's pointing out is if you listen to Jesus and you believe him whom he sent uh, and you believe him who sent me, in other words, if you believe God, then you can have eternal life. You're going you're gonna to pass from judgment you're going to have eternal life. Uh, and so you're, 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 you know, you're not going to, your life isn't going to end with, with eternal death. But verse 25 says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. Uh, for just as the father has life in himself, even so he gave to the son also to have life in himself. So Jesus is pointing out that, that at that particular time, at that hour, um, at, that, at, at, that, at that period of time that he was there, uh, he was saying that the hour is coming, and now is, uh, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Well, uh, a dead person can't hear, but a living, a physical living person can hear, and, and a physical living person can be, can be spiritually dead, and yet he can hear the voice of the Son of God, and if he believes it, then he can live. Uh, and so Jesus has the power to, to resurrect somebody spiritually. But because he says they might marvel, because they might be amazed at that, that he's the one whom if they listen to, they can have eternal life. He says in verse 28, do not marvel at this. In other words, that, you can, that he, by listening to Jesus, you can have eternal life, spiritual eternal life. He says, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb will hear his voice and will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. And so um, notice what he points out. He points out that there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you want to know how that's going to happen, 
in First Corinthians chapter 15 or how long that's going to take. Because somebody might say, well, you know, there's a long period of time in between those resurrections. Well, if you, if you take a look at First Corinthians chapter 15, where he's talking about the resurrection, uh, he says in verse 51, Behold, I tell you, mystery we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. That's when the Lord comes. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, where the trump will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. And so the idea is all the dead are going to be raised, and the Christians are going to be raised in, imperishable. And so therefore, you have it done in the twinkling of an eye. In a moment, you have it. You, you don't have it over a period of a thousand years that that's going to happen. And so uh, Paul is just simply pointing out that he, as a uh, follower of the sect, maintains the hope of God, which they cherish. And that is that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And so he's pointing that out to them, that there's going to be this this, this um, coming judgment. Now, uh, Acts 24 and 16 says, in view of this, in other words, since he believes this, since, that's, since this is what he thinks, he says, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. And so one of the things that he points out is that, is that because he believes this, then it behooves him to live uh, in a certain way. And one of those ways is to live blameless before God. Now, why is he saying that? Well, he's saying that because they're accusing him of desecrating the temple. So they're accusing him of a, a good Christian, even though he doesn't believe in the temple, he, even though he doesn't need the temple, is not going to go in and desecrate it. He's not going to go in and, and, and wreck it uh, and, and cause, cause difficulty. Uh, just because he doesn't believe it. Uh, I, I remember this lady once came to our, our church building, uh, and she said, I, I, can't, I can't live where I'm at. And, and I'm like, well, and by the way, we live, our church building is uh, surrounded by apartments. And she says, I can't live where I'm at. I need to find a new place. I said, well, why? And she says, uh, because I'm, I'm living with a heathen. And, and I said, well, what do you mean? And he says, well, she's got all, she's got all these, uh, and, and this other lady, uh, was was a uh, Roman Catholic, and so you know, don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I just want you to know the context. She was Roman Catholic, so she had a bunch of statues of, of the Virgin Mary and and those kind of things in her house, and pictures and those things. And and this other lady, who by the way I didn't know, she's walked into our church building. Uh, she said she can't live there because that lady's a heathen, and, and and she's angry at her. And I said, well, you know, first of all, why do you think she's a heathen? She said, well, she's got all these idols and statues around. Her. And I'm like, well, oh, okay, I understand that you, you, know, you don't, you, you don't uh, think uh, those are proper. And, and I don't personally either. Uh, but I said, okay, but, it, but it's her house. And, and she said, well, and, and, and I broke them and I, and I destroyed them. And so now she's mad at me. And, and I'm like, well, no wonder you're having trouble there. Uh, even though you, you might not agree with those things, it's not, it's not you who's supposed to destroy them. What you're supposed to do is get her to see the love of God so much that she's willing to put away those things and understand that she doesn't need them. And so that's the same thing here. Paul is saying, I'm not going to go into the temple and destroy it just because I don't believe that we personally need it. And not only that, but if you remember, Paul was there uh, in the temple for the purpose of being with those gentlemen who were having a, a vow, who had made a vow, and he paid for them. And so he's doing things. Uh, properly in the sight of God. And not only that, but in the sight of men. Uh, uh, Paul is not going to come and just cause trouble and difficulty uh, with individuals just, just because of his preaching. Uh, e even if you notice when Paul was arrested in, in different places, it, it wasn't because Paul would come in and callously um, uh, cause problems for people uh, so they could have these problems. Uh, no, that, that, that's not what he would do. Remember the Philippian jailer and, and you know, um, the, the individuals that, that Paul would influence were influenced not because he had the power to be able to blind them and send them, you know, and, and send them away. He did do that with one individual who was, you know, speaking uh, against the truth and, and uh, therefore Paul thought it necessary, but that's not how Paul usually did things. That's not how we do things. Uh, we, we try to, we try to live uh, in all good conscience before men uh, without being rude or causing trouble or difficulty. 
Um, and that's why the world, you know, wherever they are, should want Christians around. I mean, good Christians should want good Christians around. Sure, there's self-righteous Christians, there's arrogant Christians, just like there's self-righteous people everywhere and, and arrogant people everywhere. And certainly the, the church is not immune to that, but the church, uh, that should not be the face of the church. The face of the church should be people who are gentle and kind and merciful and forgiving and, and uh, overlooking sins and trying to bring people to Jesus. Uh, and so in, in verse 17, he says, now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation, to present offerings. So again, the emphasis is why in the world uh, would I spend a, a number of years out traveling about from church to church and for the purpose of bringing money for the poor uh, Jews that are in Jerusalem, and then I come and create a ruckus in the temple. He says, what he's pointing out, is, that's not, that doesn't make sense. Why in the world would I do that? And all they have to do is ask the, 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 the church uh, if Paul brought money for the, for the Jewish community and for the Jewish saints, and they would say yes. And so in verse 18, he says, in which they found me occupied in the temple. He says, that's what I was doing in the temple. I was presenting offerings to God in the temple. He wasn't desecrating it. He, he wasn't, uh, he, he wasn't um, destroying property in it. He wasn't calling people in there blasphemers and, and trying to get them to leave. Uh, he says, having been purified. So he was even purified. He even went through some of the rituals. So why in the world, once he's purified, would he uh, uh, invite a Gentile into the place when he knows that's not their custom? And he says, without any crowd or uproar. So, you know, he didn't cause problems in the temple. So everything Paul's saying is proof that everything the other people accuse him of is wrong, even though they really can't prove what they're saying. And he says, but there, but there were some Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation if they should have anything against me. Paul is saying that the people who actually are the ones who should be, who accuse me, they're not even here. They were Jews from Asia, and apparently they've gone back to their, to their country. They're the ones that should be present. The witnesses should be present, not people who, he, who hear it from hearsay, but those who accuse him. They're, they're the ones that should be there and should, and should be the ones accusing him so, so that they can be in, interrogated and questioned to find out if they had ulterior motives for what it was they did. And I think it's interesting that he identifies them as the Jews from Asia, because if you notice, when Paul spent a lot of time with Asia, the Jews in Asia were quite, oh, what's a good word, ruthless. They were quite ruthless and did everything they could to run Paul out and to keep anybody from hearing his message. And so you can understand why they would be the ones that assumed all these things and brought these charges to Paul. And, and again, it shows you the difference between their sense of justice and the Roman sense of justice. The Romans are looking for witnesses and the Jewish community just acts in this mob mentality. And what I'm afraid of is that's what you're starting to see in America. In America, you're starting to see this mob mentality that's going along. And, and believe me, one of the reasons for that is because people leave the, the principles of God, not the principles of our constitution, although I, I think those are founded on the principles of God, but the principles of God. And when you leave the principles of God, then you don't have respect you, you don't treat your neighbor's property right. You take your own vengeance and your own judgment, and you're not willing to submit to uh, authority, and therefore you're disrespectful to policemen, and, and you, you uh, just go along with people because they say stuff instead of actually waiting for the facts and waiting for the evidence. And then when the evidence does come out, if it doesn't go the way you want it to, or when the, when the judgment comes out and the, and the facts are scrutinized, and it doesn't come out the way they want to, then they revolt and they riot and that's simply because they're not following what God says and they're seeking their own sense of justice. That's what Jesus meant on the Sermon on the Mount when he says somebody slaps you on the cheek turn, turn the other also. That's what that's what he's referring to uh, but that's not what we see going on today in our country and it's pretty sad because I'm sure it's going to get worse because that's generally what happens. It's probably God's way of teaching us that we need to get back to him. First, verse 20 he says or else let these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council. He said, if these men want to accuse me of something, then let them accuse me of what they heard me say in the council. That, by the way, this council was the council in Jerusalem. Remember when they, fir when they first arrested Paul 
and, and Lysias, the commander, wanted to know what was going on. So he allowed them to come and, and question Paul. And that's when the high priest uh, had Paul uh, smitten on the, on, the, uh, on the face or struck on the face. And Paul called him this whitewashed tomb. You remember that? Um, and so Paul says, if I've done anything, you know, they can give witness of what I did there because they were there. You know, the, the high priest was there and, and the Jews were there. So they can, they can tell you what happened there, but they can't tell you what happened in, in the temple. They weren't even there. And so verse 21, he says, other than for this one statement, which I, which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial today before you, or I'm on trial before you today. So Paul says, uh, if you want to claim that I created a right or, or a revolt, well, I guess maybe you could, you could uh, uh, do it on the basis that I did holler out in, in the, in the uh, council. Uh, that that he don't, he's in trial for the question of the resurrection. And of course, we understand why the Holy Spirit had him do that there. And that's because he wasn't getting a fair trial. And also because th there, were, there were Sadducees and Pharisees, and they then began to fight because they had that party spirit. And so since they fought against themselves, then, you know, basically they, uh, Lysias came and took Paul and, and that ended that. And then, of course, he had the plot. And so they end up then in Caesarea, which is what's going on here. Uh, and that's that Paul says, that's the only thing, if you know, if I've done anything wrong, that's the only thing I've done wrong. You know, as I hauled out in the, in the, in the, in that meeting that uh, he's um, on trial for the resurrection of the dead. All right. So that's pretty much Paul's defense. Basically what he said is there's really no one, no one here present at the moment that can accuse me. There's no one who saw me do anything with the exception of the resurrect, you know, the statement that he made about the resurrection. Now, verse 22, but Felix, having a more excellent knowledge about the way, put them off saying, when Lysias, when Lysias the commander comes down, I, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurions for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not, be, and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. But some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. At the same time too, he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years he passed, had passed, Felix was succeeded by uh, Orsius Festus. And wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. And so here uh, we have what, what Felix does uh, next. Uh, and that is that he's heard, he's heard the, the, the charges, he's heard, Paul, he's, he heard Paul's defense. And so uh, he said, that he needs more information on this. He needs to know the exact knowledge of this. So verse 22 says, but Felix having a more excellent knowledge about the way, put them off saying, when Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. Well, at, at least um, uh, Felix uh, wanted some witnesses. He wanted somebody who was actually there. So apparently he was waiting for Lysias the commander who would, co who would come down. I don't know if Lysias came down at a certain time or, you know, at, at a certain time of the of, of the, the month, in order to report to to the um, um, rulers, or whether uh, Felix would call Lysias. But anyway, Felix wanted to know uh, more more facts because the people that are accusing him weren't there, and so he was hoping, hoping Lysias would come down and maybe be able to clarify some things for him and, and help him with that. So, and it's interesting that again. You notice the difference between the Jews and the Romans. The Jews are just out to kill Paul because they don't like what he's teaching. The Romans want to know he, if he's actually committed a crime, and so therefore they need some witnesses. And so it's a stark, it's a stark contrast between the, the, the Jewish sense of justice and the Roman sense of justice, which, by the way, is not as, as just as, as, is, the judgment of, as is the justice of God 
or the justice that Christians should have. But yes, it's but yet it's a striking contrast between the Jews' sense of justice and the Roman sense of justice, and explains why it is that the Jewish community was rejected in 70 AD and the temple was destroyed as a proof that they were no longer God's people from a from a national standpoint. Uh, but only those who uh, believed by faith and, and who trusted in Jesus by faith, as as all people, uh, would be saved. So. Uh, verse 23 says, then he gave orders to the centurion for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from mistreating him. So apparently, Felix didn't believe that Paul was a, a flight risk and therefore gave him what you and I might call a house arrest uh, in the centurion's house. Uh, and so the Paul would be there and Paul would be allowed to have people come in and minister to him. And so Lysias, or the, sorry, Felix, what, after hearing these, was convinced that Paul wasn't somebody who was going to cause trouble or, or rebel or, or that he had to lock, lock, lock him up in, in solitary confinement so that he couldn't communicate with people uh, because he might continue to cause problems and difficulties. And so he points that out uh, by allowing him to have freedom and letting his friends come and minister to him. Now, verse 24 says, but some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife. Uh, but some days later, Felix uh, arrived with Drusilla, his wife, uh, who was a Jewish, uh, Jewish, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, Felix comes with Drusilla, his wife, and so his wife was, was Jewish, and so she wanted to know about, you know, what was going on and, and why, no doubt, why the Jews were so upset with Paul. And she wanted to hear this message that Paul was preaching, because I'm sure that, you know, that's pretty much the scuttle button that's going through the grapevine is this, among the Jewish community, is this message of the, of the New Testament apostles and, you know, their view of this Jesus the Christ individual. And so she wanted to know. Uh, so it says, and sent for Paul to hear him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. So again, I want you to remember that the word Christ is not his first name. That's his title. So it's Christ Jesus. She, she wants to hear about the king who's named Jesus. She wants to hear about the ruler who's named Jesus. And so Paul came and taught her or, or spoke to them about this ruler named Jesus. Now, verse 25. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix became frightened. Now, when, when Paul sat down to talk with these people, he discussed righteousness and self-control and judgment. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting is that in John, I believe it's John chapter 14. Take a look here real quick. <clears throat> In John chapter 14, where he's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, that was 16 that I want. In John 16, yeah, where he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's, he's pointing out what the Holy Spirit is going to do. And I want you to start reading with me down here at verse 7, John 16, 7. He says, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So notice those three things. The Holy Spirit is supposed to convict people of sin, righteousness, and judgment, okay? Now, verse nine says, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and, and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. And so he, he's, he's pointing out that the work of the Holy Spirit is to do those three things, okay? It's, it's, to, do, it's to do those three things is, what, is what's under consideration. Now, let's go back over here to uh, uh, Acts, and notice what it was that Jesus, or that Paul, uh, taught. 
Felix about in Drusilla. He taught them about righteousness. That's one of the things over there. Self-control. Now, self-control was not over there, but sin was. And sin is involved when you don't have self-control. And then the third one is judgment. So he, he's teaching them these three things that the Holy Spirit was supposed to come and do to convict, to convict the world. Now, I, I'd suggest to you that we need to do those three things when we talk to people. We need to speak to them about right living. We need to speak to them about the fact that they haven't done it, and so they don't have self-control because they've sinned, and we've all let our, our lusts get the better of us, and then judgment, that there's going to be a day of judgment that, that's under consideration. Now, speaking about this idea of uh, righteousness, we know that righteousness in the New Testament implies two things. It, it implies the idea of how we get right with God and what is right with God. It, it, it's used in those two different ways. Okay, In Romans 1 and verse 16, uh, here it says, in Romans 1, 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, that the righteous man shall live by faith. So the, the righteous man here can't be referring to a sinless man, a, a person who doesn't have any sins. Uh, that, uh, he can't be referring to him because then none of us would make it. Okay? But he's referring to the fact that, that somebody believes in Jesus. And if he believes in Jesus, then he's, a, then he's counted righteousness. But then he's counted righteousness for him, as in Genesis chapter 15, when, when um, Abraham um, believed God about the fact that his descendants would be like the, the stars of heaven. And he believed God, and God said, I counted it for righteousness. In other words, I counted it as being right with me. So that's one of the ways that that word is used. The other way that, that, that this word is used is in relationship to God. When it's used in relationship to God, it always means doing right. That's exactly what it means. And that's the way it's used over here in, in Genesis, I mean, sorry, in Romans chapter 3, uh, where, where, he's, where he's talking about the, the righteousness of God. And he says down here in verse 25, this is Romans 3, 25, whom God displayed as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Now, this righteousness here is not demonstrating God's way of being right, but really it's demonstrating the fact that God is right. Now, why, why does it say that? Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Uh, and in other words, God didn't look right because he was hanging around with people who were sinners. He, was, he passed over David's sins who, who committed adultery and, and, and committed murder uh, and lied and, and caused a brother to sin. And, and he just did a bunch of terrible things uh, that we today would, would look down on. But yet God saw him as righteous. And, and yet God, who is righteous, is dealing with him. And so God looks bad. It looks like God's not righteous. But he says Jesus died to demonstrate his righteousness, that he is righteous. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For, de for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness. See, his righteousness. That he is right. And at the, pre uh, at the present time, so that he would be just. And see, God has to be just before he can justify somebody else. And so, uh, so God is just. And so that's the way that word righteousness is used. So it's used in two different ways. It's used, uh, it's used from the standpoint of righteousness, of doing what's right uh, as in relationship to God, uh, in you know, when it's used to God. And in relationship to us, it's used about how to be right. And Paul probably is doing both of those in here when he's using the, this to talk to Felix. No doubt he's telling Felix, that, you know, you're not right with God yet. You, you haven't done what God wants you to do. You haven't accepted Jesus uh, as the Messiah. Now, you, you, might, you, might ha you might believe in God. Uh, you, might, you might think there's a God out there, and you might think you're, you're acting in a way that's in accordance with him, but, but that's not the righteousness of God. You have to be in the righteousness of God in order to be counted as righteous. Now, <clears throat> why does he have to be counted righteous? Well, because his self-control was very lacking. Matter of fact, if you take a look up here, 
chap at verse three of Acts 24, where um, uh, where um, uh, Barnabas is, um, I'm sorry, where yeah, where, where Barnes notes give us a little insight as to who this Felix was. Uh, speaking about Felix, it says, uh, and this is and this is in Acts two twenty four verse three. Um, the, connected to Barnes notes, it says, in this, in this there was probably sincerity, for there was no doubt that the peace of Judah was owning to Felix, but at the same time that he was an energetic and vigilant governor, it was also true that he was proud, avarice, and cruel. Josephus charges him with injustice and cruelty in the case of Jonathan, the, the high priest, and then he gives you book, chapter, and verse, and uh, Tacitus, the, the historian, and uh, Suetonius uh, concur in these charges. So, so Felix was an individual, though he was a good ruler, you might say, and, and, and you know, tried to do what was best for the country. Personally, he was uh, cruel, proud, and, and, and avarice. And so, therefore, when Paul begins to reason with him, uh, over here, uh, about self-control, no doubt it would affect him, and, and no doubt it would it would bother him, uh, because he's he's somebody who who didn't have much self-control and who didn't uh, carry on with himself. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, uh, who was who thought of himself high, highly instead of uh, instead of um, being humble, uh, and and so. Uh, Therefore, it says that Paul then spoke to him also about judgment. And this judgment is a, is a judgment that is going to bring punishment. Now, I, I know there are some who believe in what's called, uh, they're universalists, and that is they believe God's going to eventually save every single person. Uh, I, I personally hope it's like that. Uh, I, I really do. I personally hope that God will save every single person, no matter what they've ever done ever, uh, because I certainly have individuals who I would like them to get to heaven, uh, but who it seems at this present time, their, their life is not conducive with it. Uh, and, and I've known individuals who have died that I would, uh, that I would like to have, you know, have them get, get to heaven. Uh, and so it, it's not something that's not appealing to me, but uh, I think that if the Apostle Paul is speaking to him of judgment, and this judgment carries no weight with it, then there would be no reason for Felix to become frightened. But Felix became frightened. The only way he could become frightened is if this judgment brought about um, a, a sense of punishment or a sense of, of um, it's a good word, well, a, a punitive damages, you might say. Uh, th that's what has to be under consideration. in. in um, in, in, in many places, um, Paul talks about, or the, the Gospels talk about the, the judgment of God. Uh, here's, one, here's one right here where he says at uh, the very end, or in Matthew 25, there's actually three examples of this, this kind of judgment. Uh, you have the example over here with the parable of the ten virgins, uh, where the conclusion is, uh, in verse, verse 10, when, they, when they're rejected, he says, but he answered, truly, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Uh, be on the alert then, for you do not know the hour that is coming. In other words, they're rejected by God, so, so it doesn't seem like they're going to be saved. Uh, and then uh, over here in, in Matthew 25, when he deals with the, the parable of the talents, and the fellow who, didn't use, who hid his talents, uh, it says in, in verse 28, he says, therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out that worthless slave into outer darkness, and that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then down here in the last parable that he gives them, he says, then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did, did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, 
with the righteous into eternal life. So there's the idea of eternal punishment. So there's going to be some kind of punishment, and that punishment is going to be eternal. And so therefore, whatever that eternal punishment is, uh, is, what's, is what's under consideration. So there's going to, there's going to be this judgment that, that is, is happening there. Okay. Uh, and in, in John 5, where we looked at um, the idea of, of Jesus uh, being the resurrection, uh, he also points out that uh, he, he is, uh, I'm sorry, that's not, not the verse I want, in, in John 5, it's like First John. In John 5, where we were at, uh, he also points out that those who don't hear his voice, they're, they're going to be uh, uh, raised from the dead for judgment, okay? Uh, and and they're going to they're gonna come under judgment. And, and he points out that those who believe, verse 24, that they've passed from uh, 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 death to life, and they have eternal life. So there, there is a death for those people who don't believe him. And so as, as Peter, I'm sorry, as Paul is speaking that and talking with, with um, Felix uh, about that, he's pointing out the fact that, this, that there's going to be a judgment. It says, and Felix became frightened and said, you know, in, uh, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 says, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's what's going on here. People who don't believe in God have no fear of God. Now, that doesn't mean that, they, that they're not what you and I might call nice people. They're not individuals who, you know, that, that, they'd be nice neighbors to live next to. So it's not saying that they're terrible, rotten people. Uh, it's simply saying that they're, they're sinful people. And all of us are sinful people. Uh, and, and, and so, nonetheless, there's going to be a judgment. And that judgment that comes is going to be something that should frighten them. But if they don't believe in God, if they don't believe there's going to be a God, then there's no sense of fear in them. There's no sense of, of a reverential fear. There's no need for them to curb their lusts except for societal approval. In other words, they want to be approved by, by the society they live in. But there's no other um, um, motive for, for them curbing their lusts or curbing their desires except for the fact that what other people might think of them or what physical effect it might have on them personally. But there, there's no godly effect. And, and that, that's what's under consideration. And so when Paul taught Felix, he taught him about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. And Felix was frightened because he knew there was going to be a price to, to pay. He's going to have to stand before God. He's going to have to pay. You know, he's going to have to pay the piper, as you might say. In this case, the piper is God. Now, he doesn't have to. He can have his sins forgiven just like the rest of us. If, if he believes in Jesus and submits to his will and, and begins to, to, to do the things that God wants him to do, he can have his sins forgiven just like the rest of us. And that includes anybody. And you know, for, for some people, that really bothers them. It really bothers them that God will forgive what I might call the, the small sins, But yet the people who have committed big sin, they don't want them in heaven. They don't want them to be forgiven. Uh, and yet what's important to understand is sin is sin. And it takes the, the exact same amount of grace and mercy to get uh, somebody who just sinned once into heaven as it does to get somebody who sinned a uh, hundred times or a thousand times. Uh, and even, even Jesus uh, told the disciple that if somebody sins against you, 70 times 7, you're supposed to forgive them. And certainly, we're not better than God. But that bothers some people, that Jesus is going gonna, is gonna to save people. And that's because their view or their approach to getting to heaven is one that's based on works. Because, you see, what they're saying is that guy doesn't deserve it because he didn't work good enough in his life. He did a bunch of bad, terrible things, and so, therefore, you should not let him in. He's a, he's a pedophile. He, he, he's a mass murderer. He... He, you know, raped a number of young ladies. He did terrible. See, we don't want to talk about those things. We, you know, when, when we go preach the gospel, we go preach the gospel to what we call fairly normal, socially accepted people. Um, and, and yet God can forgive anybody. And God wants to forgive everybody. Uh, 
But Felix didn't have to be frightened. But he was frightened because he didn't want to believe. Apparently, he didn't want to change his ways. And so therefore, if you're not going to change your ways, then you need to be frightened. But you had to believe in God. And he said, Felix said to Paul, go away for the present, for the present. And when I have time, I will summon you. So uh, apparently, Felix was, was bothered, was agitated, was frightened by the sermon that Paul was giving. And, and therefore, he, he had to, you know, get away from Paul for a while so he'd feel better. And he said, by the way, I'll, you know, I'll summon you when I have more time. Um, and so it says in verse 26, at the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. And so, again, this shows you the avarice of Felix. Paul just preached him about righteousness, uh, uh, self-control, and judgment. And yet, one of the reasons that Felix keep Paul in prison is so he can receive a bribe, so that Paul can pay him uh, in, in order to get out. And uh, we don't have any record of Paul ever paying him money, ever offering him a bribe. You know, there's some people who have the idea that you can just offer people a, a bribe and, and, and get out of trouble, and that God's acceptable with that. But God isn't. Uh, matter of fact, there's a, there's a proverb that speaks about um, uh, a bribe, and it never speaks about them in a good way. It always speaks about it causing damage in the long run, because that's, that's what bribes do. And that's the problem with Mexico. In Mexico, uh, a lot of times people go to Mexico, and they'll get in trouble, and they'll, they'll give the officer a bribe. And so the, the officer expects it uh, often, and therefore it perverts justice. And if you've committed a crime, you need to pay. If you haven't committed a crime, they shouldn't be stopping you in order to get money. Um, that's not that's not what should happen. And if you pay them, then you're prolonging and going along with that, uh, with with those ideas that, that are under consideration. Now, uh, uh, he says, uh, at the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. So he spent time talking with Paul. And I don't know if Paul was ever able to convince him. We don't find a record of, of that with Felix. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what happened to him in history, but it says, verse 27, but after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by uh, Porcius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews favor, Felix left Paul in, in prison. See, Paul's in prison for two years, and you, and you might say, well, why in the world was he in prison for two years? Well, two reasons. One, Felix was trying to get a bribe from him, was hoping Paul would get tired of being in prison and and, you know, and be freed uh, or won his freedom. And the second one was that he was trying to please the Jews. So he, he, was, he was trying to do the Jews a favor because the Jews were extremely hard people to, to deal with because they, they were very rebellious and they were very arrogant and they wanted uh, uh, the Roman um, uh, authorities to go away, basically so that they could have their own personal kingdom um, where they had a hierarchy and all of that because they didn't understand the kingdom of God. But, and by the way, I, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just trying to give you a background for this Jewish community so you understand why God rejected them because God did reject them. And in, individuals who think God's not gonna reject people, um, you know, he, re he rejected a whole nation here because of the way they, they treated uh, other people and their sense of justice. And it says, and so, so Felix left him in prison for two years because he wanted a bribe, and secondly, because he was doing the Jews a favor. Notice that Paul never gave him a bribe. And then it says, and Felix left Paul imprisoned. And so Paul was left imprisoned because of, uh, of those two reasons, uh, and, and also, no doubt, because the Holy Spirit had plans for him uh, in being able to do that. So, I think that's a good place for us to stop there since we're at the end of a chapter. We'll start with chapter 25 and verse 1 next week. And so let's have ourselves a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, we thank you for the, the historical information that we find in your book. We thank you for it because it helps us verify the things that you teach, the things that are said, to make sure that they're accurate, Father, instead of us just believing in something that's written. Uh, we're, we appreciate your 
way of, of revealing it and of confirming it for us so that we might know today that we have a proper record of your word. We also uh, praise you and thank you for the, for the work of Paul that continues on as we read his stories and his events. We pray, Father, that whenever we are in trouble, that we would give our defense, that we would be individuals who are not individuals who seek vengeance or revenge, but we leave that to you, uh, but that instead we are individuals who are gracious and kind and merciful, and we use the sword of the Spirit to try to influence people. We pray that if we have opportunities to teach people and to spend time with them, that we would teach them about, the ri about righteousness, sin, and judgment, Father, so that they might understand why they need to come to Jesus. We thank you for forgiving us for our sins. We thank you for paying the price. We thank you for, for your son, Jesus. And we pray, Father, that we would never become arrogant, that we would never become proud or self-righteous, but that we might understand that our righteousness and our boast, Father, is in Jesus. We praise you and thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us and pray the Lord blesses you. Stay safe.